Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Sermon for Sunday, August 13th, 2017. Today, guest pastor Charles Pearson brings us a message based on the Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33. Let's listen in. Grace, mercy, and peace are with us from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In order to understand the gospel lesson for them this morning, you kind of have to go back a couple of Sundays and get all the material that's been going on before. And basically it's this. Herod kills John the Baptist, who is Jesus' cousin. The disciples of John tell Jesus, and Jesus at that point gets into a boat and heads out on the Sea of Galilee in order to be by himself. The crowd, however, says, hmm, we know where he's going. So they get there ahead of him. Now here's a man in mourning and in some grief. And he pulls up and he sees the crowd and we're told immediately he has compassion on them. And he spends the whole day ministering to them, healing the sick. And then he gets on towards evening and people are hungry. Now the disciples have an answer and they say, let's send them away to the villages where they can buy food. Well, they're in a deserted place, so there aren't any villages, which is just kind of saying, let's get them off our hands so they aren't our problem anymore. And Jesus challenges them and says, you give them something to eat. And they've got a small boy there, a young boy there, who's got five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Think about the size of uh, five small tortillas and a couple of pickled fish. Don't think of anything big. And Jesus uses that, and I believe he fed between 10 and 20,000 people because there were only 5,000. They only counted the men. Sorry, ladies. They only counted the men, and there were 5,000 men. You know there were wives, there were other women, there were probably children there as well. So between 10 and 20,000 people. And there are 12 baskets full of food left over. And it's at that point that our text begins, the gospel lesson. Jesus has the disciples get into a boat to go across the Sea of Galilee. And then the, uh, he dismisses the crowd. And he goes to do what he came there to do in the first place, which was pray. To be with his father and to spend some time with him, and I believe to strengthen, to be strengthened for the new step ahead in his ministry. So the disciples are in the boat in the Sea of Galilee, and a storm comes up. And the waves are beating against the boat, the wind is against them, and they aren't making a whole lot of progress. We're told that it's in the fourth watch, which is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., that Jesus has finished praying and he sees them and he comes walking to them on the water. So let's pause here for a moment. The disciples are in the Sea of Galilee. It's approximately 13 miles long and eight miles wide. So if they got into the boat about dusk, and they headed out and it's between three and six in the morning. They haven't made a whole lot of progress in nine hours. I suspect they're probably bailing water and I suspect uh, that they're rowing. Some of them are rowing, some of them are bailing water. And that's a difficult position to be in. Now that doesn't sound like anything I've ever been through. Longest I've ever been on a ship was when my wife and I went on a cruise to Alaska. And that was seven days. And we took the inside passage, so it was calm water the whole way. But if some of you have been in the Navy, and you've been on a ship in a rough storm, in a squall or a typhoon, you know what kind of buffeting, no matter how large that ship might be, what kind of buffeting that ship can go through. So this, in a way, is an experience few of us have ever had. But in some ways, in other ways, we're exactly where the disciples were. 
because you've been like me through situations and circumstances in life in which you've struggled. And you've been through things at time in which you've asked the Lord, how long, Lord, is this going to take place? Why can't this end? And we've been in situations when no matter what we do or how hard we fight or struggle, we seem to be making very little progress. And all of us have gotten to the point where we are emotionally exhausted and discouraged, and when that happens, we get physically exhausted as well. And some of you may be in that kind of a situation right now. Maybe fighting against a disease, and it doesn't look like you're making any progress. Or maybe you're looking for work, and you can't find steady employment. I have a couple of friends in our Bible class at our home congregation that are going through that right now. Both of them need to find work. One of them told me that she can still see God's hand providing for her and taking care for her, but she still needs to find employment. So there are times in our lives when we feel battered and bruised, beaten, sore, exhausted mentally, physically, emotionally. And I wonder what the disciples are thinking out on the Sea of Galilee alone in the boat because Jesus wasn't there. We're told that they were amazed that he could calm the seas and the wind. But the text doesn't say they were afraid. <clears throat> Not until they thought they saw a ghost. They were fishermen. They knew the sea. So this is probably just kind of like a day in the office for them. They'd probably been through similar situations. But I still believe they're probably exhausted. And I know that when I am emotionally and physically drained, my thinking isn't always the best or most effective. And then when something unexpected happens on top of that, my reactions aren't always the reactions that I would choose to have normally. And of course, the last thing the disciples expect is for Jesus to come walking on the water to them. And when they see him, they panic and they're afraid of some ghostly apparition or, or phantasm coming after them. But of course, you and I are much too sophisticated for that kind of thing, aren't we? But I know that when I'm terrified, that I don't react rationally. And when I'm afraid, I don't think with my logic, I think with my emotions. Jesus says, take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. We often criticize the disciples for thinking that Jesus was some kind of ghost, but to their credit here, the moment that they hear his voice, they relax. They're comforted. That's faith in action. I've heard the word. I know everything's going to be okay. The masters told me, don't be afraid. So they recognized his voice and responded appropriately. Well, 11 of them pro responded appropriate, appropriately. One wasn't satisfied. And you know how the story continues. Peter stands up and says, Lord, if it is you, then command me to come to you on the water. Now, some people <clears throat> cite that as a statement of faith. And in some respects, I guess it could be. But here's the thing. To me, it also seems like a challenge. If it is you, Lord. If. And I think about all the times in Scripture when somebody has said, if to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, if you are Lord. It was Satan who said, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Throw yourself down from the temple. The high priest said, if you are the Christ, tell us. The mockers who gathered around the cross said, well, if you are the Son of God and God loves you, come down from the cross. Did you catch it? 
For 11 people, it was, necess- it was enough to hear jo- Jesus' voice and be comforted, but not Peter. Peter has to have something more. And so in one sense, he challenges Jesus. And that can be the reaction or the rejection of the comfort and mercy that Jesus offers to us. It's a way basically to say, you know, I'm not going to believe unless something else happens. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I put my finger in the nail prints of his hand and put my hand into his side. And I'm kind of amazed in a way that Jesus basically said to him, come. Because he'd already identified himself by saying, take heart. He said that a lot in the Gospel of Matthew. Take heart. He also said, don't be afraid. So Peter should have recognized, this is the master. This is the master's voice. And you and I know that when someone challenges Jesus, things don't go very well for them. So Peter walks out on the water, and he's doing fine until he sees the size of the waves that the wind is blowing up, and he begins to doubt, and he begins to sink. But here's the difference between Peter and other people that had challenged Jesus. He knows where to look when things fall apart. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And of course, Jesus reaches out, grabs his hand, pulls him up. They get into the boat. But then Jesus says to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And that's a good question, isn't it? Why do we doubt? How often I have to ask myself, am I being like Peter here? I wonder how many times, by the way, I do identify with Peter an awful lot in some of the mistakes he's made. But I wonder how many times do I challenge God? How many times do I ask him to prove to me who he says? How often have I said in effect, if you are the Lord, If you are Jesus, if you are my God, then heal my body or meet my circumstances, take care of my problems, or do it my way. So I know that there are times that I'm like Peter. By trying to do things on my own without his direction or command, by taking his word and twisting it to suit my own needs, And then I get in over my head and I begin to sink beneath the the waves. Maybe the weeds too, I don't know. But it's at that time that I do cry out to him, Lord, save me. And the story ends with Jesus and Peter back in the boat. And it's at this point that we're told the winds die down, the waves become calm, And at this, the disciples worship Jesus. This is the first time this is mentioned in the book of Matthew. The first time we are told that they worshiped him. Now that's the proper response, isn't it? When the Lord pulls you out of the deep water and brings you to safety, isn't the proper response worship? When you're healed? When the circumstances of life change, when your troubles or difficulties are overcome or removed, isn't worship the proper response? When you've just heard that you've got a new pastor coming, isn't worship the proper response? For centuries, the church was symbolized by the symbol of a boat or a ship. We are surrounded by adversity, but it's in the ship of salvation, the ship of the church, that we experience safety and salvation. Because Jesus is in the midst of her. A ship is not a static, non-moving symbol. It's a vehicle that people use to go someplace. 
And as we read the story, we may ask, well, why is Jesus going to the other side of the ocean? Why is the sea? Why is he having the disciples get into the boat? It's kind of like the question, right? Why did the chicken cross the road? Well, to get on the other side, maybe the worms were better on the other side of the road or looked better. But Jesus is going to the other side of the road because that's where people are who need him, who need his ministry, who he needs to share his love with. And that's why we get in the boat. To be going where we're supposed to be going. Not just to heaven, but to the other side. To be with people who don't have a strong relationship with Jesus. Or those, at least, who don't know him. Not the real Jesus. Some of you are old enough to remember that song, Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, you're rocking the boat. Maybe we ought to change that this morning. Get in, get in, get in, get in, get in, and move with the boat. Because the boat's where we want to be with Jesus, going wherever he's taking us, even though we don't know where that is going to be. Now, if he challenges you and asks you to get out of the boat, to move out of the comfort zone, your comfort zone, that's another thing. And while you're all rejoicing that you have a new pastor, may I disease you a little bit not disease, sickness, but trouble you a little bit by saying he's going to pull you out of your comfort zone because that's where God is going to be leading him. And God is going to be challenging you through him as a congregation and, and as individuals. But it is by your faith when you step out of the boat, you can walk on the water it isn't easy, and there's going to be things that will cause you to doubt. But the goal is to be with Jesus, whether he's out on the water or in the boat. Wherever he is, he's going to be with you. Because that's his word and his promise. And when the storms arise, and when you're filled with doubts, and when things look like they're too difficult and your comfort zone is really challenged, he's going to say to you, take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. And he's going to comfort you through word and sacrament and grace and his mercy. And he's going to help you to get to the point that he wants you to be. Would you pray with me? First of all, Father, we just praise you and we glorify you because you have answered the call, the cries of this congregation for the leadership of a new pastor. And the Holy Spirit has led someone to say yes. And though it's been a while and there have been some uncertainties and some struggles and and some doubts, we, we can look back and we can thank you, Father, because we know that you have answered our questions and you have seen our needs and you have heard our prayers. We pray for the new pastor as he comes, Father, be with him and protect him. We pray that you would be with his congregation that is learning the sad news today that he has accepted the call. But we pray that you would strengthen them and help them as they go through the call process. And we pray, Father, that you would protect him and that you would encourage us and prepare us here as a congregation to serve you in the ways you call us to be. We don't know what that's going to be. But if you want us to get out of the boat, Father, help us to do that. But lead us to the other side. Help us to be in the ministry you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to the Sunday Sermon from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.org.
www.thinkingdeeply.com.